Welcome to this Design Online webinar from Eureka Magazine in association with Henkel Loctite. Uh, today's presentation is entitled Discover Structural Bonding and Adhesive Design Performance and will be presented by Bob Goss and Dr. Julie Joseph, Senior Technology Specialists at Henkel. Before I hand over to them, however, uh, I should just let you know that if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the box on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, we will be taking Q&A at the end but if your question shouldn't isn't answered at the end, we can uh, forward it to Henkel, who will answer it offline for you. And with that, it just remains for me to hand over to Bob. Bob, take it away. Okay, thank you. So just a quick introduction into myself and Julie. We've both been at Henkel Loctite for a number of years now, and uh, essentially we're in the customer technical service group. And our role is to give technical advice on adhesives for uh, industrial applications up and down the country. So we've both written ad adhesive seminars or presented adhesive seminars at conferences throughout Europe. And we regularly give design adhesive presentations to design engineers, uh, design consultancies and university universities up and down the country. So. We're going to go through a number of different things in, in structural bonding. Um, so to start off with, I'll show you a few. There's a few examples here. So in the top left there, you can see some loudspeakers. Now, a loudspeaker, there's a number of different adhesives used in a loudspeaker, bonding the magnets, the cone and the coil and the surround. And because of the variety of different materials in there, you cannot manufacture a loudspeaker without using adhesives. And they've been manufacturing um, adhesive, manufacturing adhesive, manufacturing loudspeakers um, with adhesives for more than 40 years. So if you don't believe in adhesives, don't listen to a loudspeaker. The next one along on there is a train floor. Now adhesives are used in the train industry very widely, in the rail industry. Uh, and it, we, next time you step into a train, the floor is likely to have been bonded on with a structural adhesive. Again, if you play golf, the composite shaft is bonded to the head with an epoxy. Again, on the right there is a filter. There's a number of applications for filter bonding. Filters are used in, that one's an air filter. Fil air filters are present in things like vacuum cleaners, in your car, uh, in air conditioning units. And the end caps and the pleats are all bonded together with various different adhesives. And skylights, Julie will go through applications in uh, bonding glass to metal. The medical industry, for example, a lot of us have now been vaccinated. I've actually been double vaccinated. And the little cannula, I'm not showing in that one there, but the little cannula uh, in the hub is bonded in with a UV curing adhesive. Now, absolutely vital that that stays structurally bonded. We're not talking specifically about that particular application here, but just to give you an idea of the variety of engineering applications where adhesives are used. And finally, there is magnet bonding. We'll be touching a little bit more on that a bit later on. So I'm gonna show you here, there's three different methods here of joining two bits of metal together. So it's basically a top hat section and two top hat sections bonded back to back. So on the left-hand side, as a bolted assembly, but that could also be a riveted assembly where you're mechanically fixing the two top hat sections together. And then in the middle, there's a, the same two pieces of metal, but this time they're spot welded together. And then finally on the right, the two top hat sections are bonded with a structural adhesive. So there, these are obviously various ways of joining two bits of metal together. Now, the benefits of using an adhesive are to do with the stress distribution over the bonded area. When we'll be talking about a little bit more about this in a moment, but if you take, for example, the middle one where the spot welded one is, by using an adhesive, you can eliminate at these high stress concentrations. And when you do spot weld, you get these heat marks on the top surface of the metal and the adhesive will eliminate those aesthetically can be in certain applications can be uh, not ideal from an aesthetic point of view. Adhesives can also provide a weight saving opportunity and because they're essentially a plastic they will seal the joints and join dissimilar materials which is a major benefit in adhesives. So if one of those was steel and one for aluminium you couldn't easily um, weld those two parts 
uh, you can either mechanically um, join them or you use an adhesive. And as I say, the adhesive can act not only as a, a structural point joining method, but also risk the re uh, reduce the risk of corrosion. Right, so what we have here is a little video showing a, a beam under compression. So if you could just run that video, Julie. So here the piston is coming forward. You can see the beam has collapsed and the rivets have popped out because of the high stress concentrations in the middle. And eventually the piston in slow motion here hits the end stop and the beam has been pushed away. Right. In the next slide, this one here is a uh, spot welded uh, beam. And again, if we play the video, a bit, again, the piston comes in from the left hand side. And you can see here that the, it's doing quite well until you get to about two thirds of the way across and then the, the beam will suddenly collapse at this point here. You can see about now you can see the, the beam collapsing and the piston then pushing forward, pushing the, the beam out of the way until it hits the end stop. And then if we do the third one, which is the bonded assembly, then, and we come again, again with a, the piston coming in, again, you can see the, the, the beam starting to collapse. But as the piston travels across, you get to a point where the, the beam hasn't collapsed at all. And in fact, at about now, the force required has gone beyond the excess of the piston and it hasn't actually reached the end stop because the beam itself is strong enough to withstand the force of that piston. So that's a, a, an excellent example of showing where a structural adhesive is, is suitable. So going on now to the design principles, if we go to the next slide. Now here on the left hand side, the adhesive there is shown to be in compression. And that's the ideal scenario for the adhesive. The second one along is an intention. The adhesive there, good stress distribution. Um, and certainly if you can create the joint such that it's under compression or tension, then generally you get good results. A lap shear joint is also good. And um, in that case, uh, you, there is a higher stress concentration at the end, but there are ways of overcoming that with intricate design. Now we can, the worst scenario is where you've got the adhesive is under either a cleavage load or a peel load. Now, the difference between them is that a cleavage is where you have very rigid parts and you can't bend the substrate, whereas peel is where you can roll back the substrate and it subjects a very severe load on the on the actual component. Now, Henkel, we do offer uh, advice on how to design a joint. So we haven't really covered here, for example, coaxial joints or say a tongue and groove joint. Um, so there are lots of different options for bonding and we would certainly be pleased to talk to you about your individual application. So going back to those um, three scenarios we saw earlier, on the left hand side we have the mechanically assembled bolted or riveted joint and the reason when, as that was, when that was compressed under that piston, the reason the rivets popped out was because there was a very high stress concentration at those holes and the beam just collapsed. The spot welding one fared somewhat better, but eventually the beam collapsed because the, there was high stress concentration and eventually the beam uh, folded as the piston came across. But as you saw in those videos for the bonded one on the right there, we've got a very even stress distribution, not just along the length of that uh, top hat section, but also across the entire width. So there's a distribution of the stress right across the joint and therefore the joint was proved to be, in that particular case, the strongest option. So if we go to the next slide, here we've got various simple joints. So on the left hand side, you have a, a plate placed on top of another plate with a load underneath it. But by using the same components underneath that and just putting the plate underneath it, you transform that into a compressive load and therefore you eliminate any possible peel on that joint. The middle one's a little bit more difficult where you've got a 180 degree peel. You've got the, two, the forces acting directly onto a, a bonded joint there. And in this particular case, we've been able to, just below that, you can see we put a plate across the top of the joint to try and minimize the peel strength. Now that may not always be possible, but certain, by thinking about where the stresses are in the joint, 
then you can eliminate and maximize the opportunity for using adhesives. And finally, on the right hand side, the L part was placed initially on top of the, uh, the first substrate, but simply by placing the L underneath the, uh, the first substrate, you immediately put the adhesive under a compression just by using the same parts, but by moving the uh, component to a different area. So it just ways of uh, improving it. And as, as I mentioned earlier, we'd be pleased to help you with your particular application in, in optimizing the, adhesive, the joint for adhesives. So we're now going to look at surface preparation. And if you think about when you're mending your bicycle puncture, ideally you should you certainly make sure the, the puncture is that the tire is dry and you would get a piece of rubber of a, a abrasive paper and you would abrade the rubber to roughen up the surface. And the same things apply in industry. So ideally the surfaces should be slightly roughened and that helps with the mechanical interlocking of the adhesive into the substrate layer. Um, and we talk about both adhesive and cohesive failure. So the adhesive has not only got to bond to the adherent or the substrate, so that's the adhesion, the adhesive, adhesive, and there's also cohesive. So the adhesive has to stick to itself. So when you look at a failed adhesive joint, you need to examine the joint carefully. If it's come clean away from one of the surfaces, that's known as adhesion adhesive failure. If there's adhesive on both surfaces, then that's cohesive failure. And so if you have cohesive failure, then you need an adhesive which is stronger. And Julie will be talking about the different types of adhesive we have. We have some adhesives which are very, very strong and some which are somewhat weaker, but there are reasons why we would do that. And Julie will go that, into that a bit later on. Now, one of the things about structural um, adhesives is that contamination can give us issues. So in the second part of that picture, you can see there, there's some contamination on the surface. Now that can originate from oxide layers, it can originate from oil or muck on the surface. So we need to ideally give, give the adhesive the best chance by giving by producing nice clean surfaces. So if we go to the next slide, here Henkel sell a number of different cleaners and they come in aerosols or um, cans and you would run, typically for say aluminium, you would clean the surface, abrade it, and then clean again. Now, in some situations, we use an activator, and the activator is there. Some of them have an on part life or the open time, so you would need to get the adhesive part together during the open time of that uh, adhesive system. Now, in terms of bond line thickness, typically, as a good rule of thumb, the thinner the bond line, the stronger the joint. But in some situations, a little fillet of adhesive outside the joint can help to dissipate the stress. So again, joint design is important and cleaning is important. So we mentioned earlier about roughening up the surface. So with metals, grit blasting is ideal. It refreshes the metal surface, removing the oxide layer. Um, but if you can't do that, then just simple abrasion. And, but there are plenty of adhesives which will, which will accommodate um, a certain amount of just as received surfaces. And that should be the benefit of these modern engineering adhesives. In some situations, we use a, a primer or a, a wipe, and that container on the right there is Bondorite 1455, which um, contains a chemical which enhances the, uh, or if you like, forms a chemical bridge between the substrate and the adhesive. And that comes as in wipe form, or it also comes in liquid form, and our tests have shown that with Bondorite 1455, we can enhance the strength of something like an epoxy by typically around 15%. So going to the next slide, Julie will now take you through the different types of adhesives for uh, structural bonding. So when we talk about um, a struct uh, structural adhesive, we're talking about a permanent bond. And there's a number of categories of adhesives that, that fall into this area. So on the left hand side, we've got epoxies. They're very strong, but they don't have a great deal of flex flexibility and elongation. So maybe only a few percentage of elongation. And as we move through acrylics to polyurethanes, MS polymers, and then finally to silicones, the strength reduces 
but the elongation increases significantly until we get to silicones and we've got several hundred percentage of elongation available. And, and this is just another representation of the same slide. So we start on the left hand side with epoxies and they're going to have a strength of about maybe 35 megapascals, but just a few percentage of elongation. And then as we move along to the right hand side through acrylics, polyurethanes, MS polymers, and then to silicones, we reduce the strength, but at the same time, increase the elongation available. And by the time we get to silicones, we may only have one or two megapascals of strength if you do a traditional lap shear test, but we've got several hundred percentage of flexibility available. And we're going to go through these technologies individually, and then you'll understand why you would use one rather than another. So we start with epoxies, and epoxies are used for bonding rigid substrates, and this is where you want a maximum strength is required and flexibility isn't really needed. So at the top, we've got an example of where we bonded the, heat, the end caps of a heat exchanger on. In the middle, we've got the example of a, a golf club. So the head of the golf club has been bonded on. You don't need much flexibility for that type of application. And you can also use an epoxy where maybe you can't weld. So at the bottom, we've got a bicycle fork there um, and the composite arm has been used to be bonded onto it's a titanium or an aluminium axle there on the bicycle. And epoxies are proven to have very good chemical resistance. As a technology, they're very versatile and we have a wide range of products available with different characteristics. So some are conducting, some are insulating, and we do have epoxies that are fairly flexible also. Um, but it, it's probably a good rule of thumb to say that if you want optimum durability for a structural application, then you'll need a slow curing epoxy. OK, so we move on now to the two step acrylics. Now, now these are materials where the way they work is you you spray on the activator, which is a solvent based material, and then you apply the adhesive to the second substrate. And they only cure when you bring these two parts together. So it's got a long on part life and it's effectively a cure on demand system. So it's got lots of different applications. Um, at the top, we've got the example, they, they're very good at bonding dissimilar substrates. At the top, we've got the example of where we're bonding a metal knob onto a glass plate. Um, in the middle, we're bonding together high speed motors where, where this part here is going to go into this housing that sits at the back. And at the bottom, we've got the example of mainly stainless steel handrails where the, the fast cure that two step acrylics give us is really used. So you can bond those parts together. You maybe only have to wait one or two minutes for the curing and then any excess adhesive that's outside the joint, that fillet won't cure. And so you're able to wipe it away and get a clean bonding system. We move on next to polyurethanes and, and polyurethanes are a great balance between strength and flexibility. They're very, very good at bonding dissimilar substrates. So, for example, both metals and plastics. Um, polyurethanes do contain isocyanates. So you do need to ensure that you've got appropriate ventilation during application. And they cure via moisture. So you do need to make sure that they're stored appropriately. Now, we've got a number of applications. They, they are appropriate for a very wide number of applications at the top. We've got a flatbed trailer example, and they can be used in all sorts of trailers, anything like from a flatbed as here, everything to up to horse boxes. And then on the right, we've got caravan bonding, and they're, they're used extensively in caravan bonding because there's big surface areas involved here. And with a big surface area, you get very high strength. They can also be used to bond the interior furniture in place. Because of the durability that polyurethanes have, they've also got a lot of applications in glazing. Now, now we've got some traditional 
roof windows in place here as an example. But they're also used to bond the front windscreens into cars. And that's a safety critical application because when the airbag goes off, the windscreen has to be able to withstand the full force of a head-on crash. And they're proven in this application. Filter bonding, including medical filters, is also another big application for polyurethanes. And we can we have adhesives that will do all of these applications from end cap bonding to pleat bonding. And finally, just to show you the, the breadth of the different applications where polyurethanes can be used, we just wanted to show you wind turbine blade bonding, even though it's quite a niche application, um, just so that you understand that you, you, you can think you can think very broadly in terms of where a polyurethane can be used. So we just have here on the next slide a specific example of where polyurethanes have been used in caravan bonding. Now this is where bonding was used to replace around 800 screws. So we we replaced all of the mechanical fixings that were bonding together a caravan. And if you think about what's involved in using 800 screws is a huge amount of effort that goes into putting 800 screws in into a caravan but there's also a huge inventory associated with this and using adhesives we were able to remove all of these 800 screws and the 800 holes that come with it and obviously if you're drilling holes into a substrate you're potentially weakening the substrate and you're also giving you're also producing potential leak parts. So we're really able to eliminate all of these by using just bonding. And as a consequence, the, the, sh the shell was much stronger than the original mechanically fixed shell. We were also able to reduce the, the weight significantly. Um, so it gave the customer much more fr de design freedom with the caravan and they were able to incorporate other characteristics into the caravan. OK, so we move on now to the, the silane modified polymers uh, or MS polymers. And these materials are very, very elastic. They typically cure through moisture, although we do have 2K options available also. They've got excellent health and safety because they've got no solvents, no isocyanates and no silicones. And they've got good primerless adhesion onto a whole range of substrates. They can be used in floor bonding. We've got your train floor example in here where the, the large surface area gives you a very high bond strength overall. They're also used in solar panel bonding. So we're bonding the panel onto the frame in this example. And they're also used in light fittings because they've got good UV stability. And in this particular example, because of the tolerances in blown glass, there was a relatively large gap to fill between the glass bowl and the metallic fitting at the top of the light. And the MS polymers were able to fill these. Okay, we move on to silicones now. And silicones have really excellent temperature resistance. So typically up to 300 degrees C, although they can go higher if it's just intermittent. Um, and they've also got extremely good flexibility. So a, a good example of where uh, silicone can be used is in potting, but also on something like an oven door, where there could be large differences in the thermal expansion of the materials used. So in this example, where we've got a glass door being bonded to an, an outer metallic frame, then the silicone has good flexibility, but it also has it, it's over an, a, a big enough surface area so that there is sufficient strength. Now, if we put something like an epoxy onto this application, it would have cracked the glass when we turned the oven on because it wouldn't have had enough flexibility to be able to accommodate that heat difference. Now, all of the adhesives that we've spoken about, they, they all lend themselves very well to being dispensed. And if you do dispense an adhesive, it gives you a number of advantages. So it means that you're dispensing the correct volume, so you don't under dispense or over dispense. It also means that you're dispensing them in a safe way. And it also means that you're ensuring your, the quality of your end product. 
And as Henkel, we do have a whole range of equipment available. Now, we've got an idea, give some examples here to give you an idea. So we go from hand handguns to benchtop dispensers to drum pumps. Um, and if you are interested in our equipment range, then there is an equipment webinar available on our website. And we just wanted to give you an idea of some, some new technologies that, that we're developing at Henkel. So we've got hybrid adhesives. And these are really a combination between a structural adhesive and instant adhesives. Now, each of these technologies have their own advantages. Structural adhesives give you a very durable bond, whereas an instant adhesive or a cyanoacrylate, they give you a very fast bond, but are not so durable. And a hybrid is really the best of both of these worlds. So it's a very fast fixture time with a very durable bond. Um, so it's the best of both worlds. Now, in addition to this, in addition to these two advantages, they also have some significant health and safety advantages. So you can see here in terms of hazard symbols, the traditional technologies that we have do have a number of hazards associated with them, whereas the hybrid adhesives have minimal hazards present. So just in, in, in summary, structural adhesives contribute substantially and permanently to the, to the, to the integrity of the component being produced. Um, they, they're able to outperform mechanical fixings at a lower cost, while at the same time facilitating design freedom and delivering reliability. Now, if, if you are interested in what we've presented today, then please do get in touch with us. You can find us on LinkedIn and YouTube. We've also got an extensive website or you can use the old fashioned method and you can give us a call or email us. And now we have some time for some questions. Thank you very much, Julie. Thank you very much, Bob. Yes, we do um, have some questions for you. Um, I'll start with this one. Um, can you comment on the uh, durability of your structural adhesives? How long will the adhesive last in my application? OK, it's very difficult. We do get this question quite regularly. People will say that, you know, they want their adhesive to last, say, for 25 years if they're underwater or whatever it happens to be. It's always difficult for us to provide uh, a particular set of data for every scenario. It's our experience, however, that we would normally expect to see something happen to the adhesive within a thousand hours. And you'll see on our technical data sheets that we could do a lot of data where we subject the bonded lap shear to oil or water or acetone or whatever the chemical might, so, so a wide range of chemicals, and we give data over a thousand hours. And typically, if something's going to happen to the adhesive, we would normally expect it to happen within the first a thousand hours. So we get a lot of uh, inquiries and we do a lot of work with customers directly here at Hemel Hempstead, where we test our products we put, and, um, in uh, environmental test chambers, and we put them in there, but it, it should give you a degree of confidence that our products would be suitable. Thank you very much. Um, second question, do you have any adhesives that are recommended where you have a severe peel load? Yes, so some of the rubber toughened epoxies um, are suitable for peel loads. Uh, what happens is when you've got, a, uh, say, a standard epoxy or a, a product, um, they can be quite brittle. And so as soon as you generate a stress at one end of the joint, a, a crack is formed and that crack can propagate through the adhesive. Some of our products are rubber toughened and the, the adhesive with the rubber fillers helps to arrest and stop that crack propagating. The other thing is that what Julie talks about different flexible adhesives. And so where there is a high peel load, we would certainly look at using a more flexible adhesive, which is rubbery, if you like, and that allows, therefore, you to accommodate a certain amount of flexing between the parts. OK, thank you. Um, and can you comment on the chemical resistance of your structural adhesives, uh, e.g. resistance to hot, they specify 120, divide, 120 degree C oil? OK, again, we would have to help the customer choose the correct adhesive for the application. Epoxies generally have very good solvent resistance, whereas something like, a, say, a modified silane might struggle a bit under very hot oil. So 
Again, we would have to look at each individual application in its own right, but we do give data on for that sort of thing, and we do have some products. Um, and in fact, in, for example, in your vehicle, um, silicon gasketing products have been used for more than 25 years for sealing the individual levels, uh, parts of your engine, with the exception of the head gasket and the exhaust manifold. Okay, uh, next one. How do you recommend that you make an adhesive selection? I've been looking at the strength of an adhesive, uh, but after this webinar, I think I probably need some flexibility also. Okay, again, it's probably the best to get in touch with us. We do have a, 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 some sales engineers throughout the UK and Ireland, and they can come on site and do an implant seminar for you and talk to you in individual engineers about applications. Or as Julie says, you can contact us by email or telephone or uh, on the on the website, and we will look at each individual application and try and give you the appropriate uh, advice for designing and selecting the adhesive. I think if you've got, uh, generally speaking, for very large parts, people really think they might need a very strong adhesive. But if you've got large bond areas like that train floor. When, when they first came to us, they said, oh, they wanted a really strong epoxy for that. We said, well, no, you don't. You, you've got plenty of bond area there. You can get away with an adhesive, which has only got a strength of, say, two to three uh, megapascals. And it's more than strong enough because you've got so much bond area. So it really does depend on the application as to uh, what it, which adhesive we would recommend for the individual application. OK. And the final one. Um once the adhesive is hard, can a full load be applied? How long do you need to wait before you can apply load? That really depends on the application. Julie talked about the two-part acrylics. They will get very good handling strength very quickly within a few minutes. And that, that handrail bonding application, you, you need to be able to have the whole thing to support itself very quickly. And in magnet bonding, again, you don't, if the magnets are magnetized, you don't really want them, you don't really want to have to clamp the magnets for very long because they, if they're bonded north, south and uh, then they will fly together if you're not having a good adhesive for curing very quickly. But as Julie mentioned, with epoxies, for example, a slow curing epoxy is generally beneficial from a durability. So it's always going to be a balance. Um, but in most applications, the adhesive will gain some sort of handling strength within anything between an hour or a few minutes up to a few hours, and then full strength in between 24 and 72 hours. So again, it depends on the application um, and the, the type of adhesive. The polyurethanes, for example, some of the polyurethanes will cure in a few minutes and some in a few hours. So it really depends on the application. Okay, thank you very much. Um, that's all the questions we have time for um, at the moment. But as I said earlier, if you've uh, asked any questions that haven't been um, answered, we can we will pass them on to Henkel and uh, they will answer them for you offline. And with that, it just remains for me to thank you, Bob, and, and you, Julie, um, and of course, to thank our audience. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks.